Uh, please take me to the book of First Kings, chapter number 17, and verse number 8. First Kings, chapter number 17, and verse number 8. Are we there? Well, I'm going to just read it. Okay. Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, let's go on. Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. See, I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. So he arose and went to Zarephath, and when he came to the gate of the city, indeed, a widow was there gathering sticks, and he called to her and said, Please bring me a little water in a cup that I may drink. And as she was going to get it, he called to her and said, Please bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. Father, in the name of Jesus, anoint my lips of clay to declare your word. May I decrease as you increase. After all has been said and done, receive all honor and all glory. For it's in Jesus' name we do pray and believe. Amen and amen. Well, for the few minutes that I have, allow me to minister. And I've titled this sermon, The Shift. Somebody said the shift. And I will perambulate and go up and down through that scripture and a few others as time of, uh, allows me uh, just to push in my message. Shift, uh, if you look at the English dictionary, uh, the meaning of shift is to move or to cause to move from one place to another or the change of gear on a vehicle. Paps was telling us here last week that uh, if uh, we are a generation of automatic cars, but the Yesteryear generation were using manual cars. And when you ignite the engine, and you, of course, start with gear one, when you drive after some moments, the engine demands for a second gear or a higher gear. It will not, you, you, you will feel it because the engine will even change the sound, and that's when you know it is time to shift to gear two. When you move to gear two and you cruise in a very long uh, road, it will now demand for gear three. And if you ignore the demand of the engine, you will overwork it and you will mess your engine. So it is of paramount importance that you move as the engine demands. And that is the same with our lives. There is a place you get to and everything around us demands that we move to the next level, isn't it? Just like when you went to school, you were in nursery school. But when your intelligence was uh, lifted, it demanded for you to go to class one. And then you went to form one. And for those of you whose intelligence went to another level, you qualified for university, isn't it? And that is why you are even paid based on your academic qualifications. Can I get an amen? So shifting is of paramount importance if we are going to make anything out of our life. Even for those of you who, ladies who have given birth, who have children, we have three shifts the first trimester where the baby can still play around, around the amniotic fluid and all that, then you get to the second trimester. But when you get to the third trimester, the baby changes position and locks because it is now ready to come out, isn't it? And when you go to the labor ward, you get to a place where when you're seven centimeters dilated, you are told now it is time for the baby to come forth. Meaning, from a season of being a pregnant or an expectant lady, you shift to being a mother. And there are some things you have to do. Ladies and gentlemen, no woman here who was given birth will tell you they just went to the labor ward and they were given some ice cream and some watermelon and they were updating their Facebook and the baby came out. They were told you have to push. And sometimes you're told it's, you only have actually three pushes. When it goes beyond three, you as a mother are at risk. And the child is also at risk. So when the time comes, even if there's a, the president is having a quiet cabinet meeting out there, it does not matter because the time to move has come. Go to the labor board. They will scream, and that's a woman who has a PhD. That is a time your academic qualification, your position does not matter because everything around you is demanding that you have to push for the season to come. Now, we have said that we have done the first year, the first half of the year. Now we are going into the second half. It is a new season. It is time to shift. Hallelujah. And if you look at Elijah, ladies and gentlemen, he was, of course, at the brook and dried up. And the things around him demanded for him to do what? 
to shift. Otherwise, uh, had he stayed there, he would have died of starvation. Isn't it? Uh, are you following me? Now, Elijah, the season shifted because it had dried up. It means then your time here is done. And every time God tells you your time is done, he has prepared something else for you. But after he commands you, the onus is on you to obey the voice of the command. Hallelujah. Abraham had to obey. Go yonder and give me your favorite son. He was told this time next year, you will have a child. Well, he didn't just sit back and say, the divine voice has spoken. So miraculously, just like Jesus, uh, the baby will come forth. No, he had to do something. He didn't go to watch TV with his wife. He had to go to the bedroom. Can I get an amen? If you don't get that, you'll get it at home. But the Lord is still on the throne. So I want to talk to people who feel the time to move is now. You have been perambulating in mediocrity for too long. You have sat in that place for too long. And sometimes we blame the devil when he does not deserve to be blamed. We are in, our, in certain places based on our disobedience to the command of God. I don't know where you are. And many a times, yes, people want to, uh, when we listen to this scripture, many like to dwell on the story of Elijah. But please, allow me now to take you to this widow. Because God orchestrates things. As much as he was transiting uh, Elijah to be fed by this widow, he was also setting up the widow for something else. And I want you to know, in those days, widows were not really respected. In fact, widows had no inheritance. And they were generally poor. A lady who has lost a husband is a widow, isn't it? And Ladies who are married, you should see the way they walk into church. They have confidence because there's a man beside them. There's protection beside them. There's provision beside them. There's a priest beside them. But when a lady loses a husband, you feel you are exposed. Many women don't even want you next to their husbands because they think you want to take over. So you have been rejected. They whisper in low tones, gossiping you. Now, I want you to understand, yes, they were really disowned. In fact, those days, if you read the book of Genesis, the widows were known even by how they dressed. You are known by your situation. The man who was, whose family has never gone beyond form four. The woman who no man can meet because the husband died. In fact, they will even say, you know what? Maybe you even killed your husband. But God has a way of reminding you that yes, you have no inheritance. But he's the husband to those widows. And, and God decides to have the spotlight on this widow. And, and, and of course, as the scripture goes, so verse 10 says, so he arose and went to Zarephath, and when he came to the gate of the city, indeed, a widow was there gathering sticks and called and said to her, please bring me a little water in a cup that I may drink. I don't know where you are at in your life. You feel that, yes, the time has come that there is nothing. There is no light at the end of the tunnel. Some of you have come here to offer your last prayer. Some of you have come here to say, God, if you do not meet me today, for me and you, it is goodbye because I have tried for too long and nothing seems to happen. But God is a speciality in dead situations. When you feel you have come to your end, so, of course, when he got there, he said to the lady, give me a cup of water. But watch this. After obedience, if you want to really move to your new season, obedience is better than sacrifice. Obedience to the command of God. What has God told you, but you're still playing around based on your situation. Yes, God has told you put in those applications, but because uh, for the last five years you have been rejected, every job application you have put through, you have been given an apology. So when you get used to your situation, even the voice of God is drowned. But ladies and gentlemen, we are going into a new season. But you've got to believe it so much. I like using uh, a word perhaps like rhomboxious faith. That faith that will even make you think you are crazy yourself. Hallelujah. No, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now faith after obedience, of course, will draw 
the blessings of God. They say, by faith, the elders obtained a good report. A good report is something good, something positive, something that will make you happy, isn't it? But if you want to obtain a good report, the foundation of a good report is what? Is faith. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Says, of course, Hebrews 11.1, 1, Now faith is a substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Now, in my understanding of English, and it is not too bad, the word now does not mean what you will do five minutes from now. It does not mean what you will do in the afternoon. The word now means immediate, isn't it? And faith, when you say you have faith, it is in the midst of not even looking like that thing that the Lord has said you have. Some of you have told you have been told uh, you are rich. Some of you have been told you are preachers. Some of you have been told uh, you will travel the world over. He has given the nations unto you. But the farthest you have gone is Yokimao. In fact, when you go to Machakol People Park, it's like you have gone to New York. But then the Lord said, I have given the nations to you. But because you're perambulating in Siokimau, you have not even bothered getting a passport. You have not even bothered going to the net to look at the behaviors of the people in the U.S. How to go and how you check into a plane. Because you are used to that situation. This widow has been rejected. This widow has no inheritance. So of course, why would even God remember me? God should remember the women who are married and with seven children all serving God. What? Uh, me? There is nothing. And let me tell you, your faith will, be, something will demand your faith. Watch this. When Elijah asked the woman to get some water, she didn't need faith to get the water. And that is why she did not argue. She just was on her way to get the water. But listen to what happened after that. The moment he asked for the morsel of bread, that is when faith was demanded. Why? She had so little. She said, actually what I have, I just want to prepare with my son to eat and do what? And die. So her faith was not demanded at the water stage. Because it is easy. She had it. It is easy to say, I'm doing this in faith. I'm giving 1,000 shillings in faith because you have 1,800 shillings. But as you're coming with your 1,000, you're here saying, no, we need 15,000. That is when your faith is pushed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So let's not play with that small kind of faith. That faith that is limited to what we can do. If you can do it, you don't need faith. You have been graced to do it. I don't need faith to do grace news. I'm gifted to do news. But I need faith to apply for a job in CNN. <laughs> Hallelujah. Because I don't have a journalism degree. But God can say, that is where you're going. Hallelujah. No, hallelujah. But by the way, when I started doing grace news, I needed faith. I had never done it before. I had never even been to KBC. And because of, I, I love, I give this testimony everywhere I go. When I did Grace News, is when media opened up for me. So some of you are thinking you have to make it out there to come. You have to be insulated here for manifestation and penetration out there. So in fact, on a footnote, if you're not serving in any department in church, you are doing yourself a lot of injustice because there are blessings that are held together based on what you do in the house of God. You're wondering why things are not happening out there. Let's open our inner eyes. Hallelujah. So the widow, of course, did, need, did not need to activate the faith about the water. But when she was asked to, to, to bring a morsel of bread, that demand was placed on her because it was her last provision. And she said, if I'm to provide this, I need a divine orchestration for this to happen. But sometimes 
Our own words are the ones that entice us and, and, and tie us down. Even Proverbs chapter number 6, I think in verse number 2 says, you have been ensnared by the words of your own mouth. Sometimes our own words are defeatist based on our situation. This woman saw a hopeless future. This woman actually did not see any future. This woman saw death and she spoke death from her own mouth. Hallelujah. And let me tell you, Ephesians tells you the power that is in you is the same power that raised Christ from the dead, isn't it? So whatever Whatever you say cannot be something small. So what are you saying? This woman said we just want to eat and do what? And die. Maybe some of your words are the ones that are ensnaring you. And today as you shift to a new season, you got to now say the things that the Lord says about you. Not what people say. You can imagine this is a widow. And a man of God comes to sleep in that house. Imagine the rumors. Imagine the rumors. You yourself, you see a brother and a sister at Java. You say you saw them at Hilton in a room. Now you can imagine the rumors that would have come that this is a widow and there's a man of God staying in her house. Do you think you live and say, God has sent that man? You say, no, they're in sin. You know yourselves. Hallelujah. You know, if church gossip was a company, it would do better than Safaricom in the stock exchange. Hallelujah. No, Hallelujah. If it's there, you just say, ouch. Verse number 12 of the same chapter. So she said, after she was told, please bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. Uh, verse number 12 says, so she said, as the Lord your God lives, I do not have bread. Only a handful of flour in a bin and a little of oil in a jar. And see, I'm gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare it for myself and my son, that we may eat it and Die. And Elijah said to her, do not fear and go and do as you have said, but make me a small cake first. You know, you'd think Elijah is the most arrogant man. I have just told you, I have so little and all I have is for me and my son. And you're asking for cake, a morsel of bread. And you say with so much apostolic audacity, before you eat and die, prepare for me first. That is how God will stretch you. Before you pay your rent, take care of my house first. Not realizing that when you take care of his house, you will win a house in Safari Mempesa something. <laughs> in fact, some of you, your blessing is on just one Mempesa transaction. I think they are giving some house. But because you are playing around, that landlord who is calling you because it's the fifth of the month, and that's why you'll pay rent for the next 11 years. Receive it in Jesus' name. <laughs> so please, it may seem untoward. Some things God will ask you to do in the eyes of men, even in your own eyes, it will look crazy. Imagine Abraham. He was over the hill, if you understand what I'm saying. He could not, biologically, it was impossible for him to even try. But then the Lord is saying, this time next year, you will have a child. Imagine if you went to his boys, and then he's limping. God has said, and you're telling 25-year-old boys, they'll say, no, we will need to help you. No, but, 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 but when God speaks... When God speaks, it may not make sense. But when it does not make sense, it is when you know God is in the situation. But the problem, ladies and gentlemen, we are looking for sense in the things of God. And the things of God cannot be in, in the box of sense. You are 40. You are 45. There are 22 year olds around you walking like slay queens and God has told you, you are next in line for marriage and you are looking around and saying, no, but they are better than me. It does not make sense in the physical. As long as the divine voice has spoken, you take that word and walk with it. They will call you crazy. By the way, they will call you crazy. And if you want to know God is in a move, is when people call you crazy. Even your prayer partners say you need deliverance. Because there's something that God has told you. It does not make sense. Hallelujah. And I want you to think really hard as I speak to you. Because I know without fear of contradiction that the Lord is ushering us into a new season.
but it is for the, the preserve of the people who will be obedient to the command. Because had Elijah not obeyed the voice and the command, he would have missed and the widow would have missed. So there are things you are ignoring, but it's not just you suffering, but there are other people in that chain who are depending on your obedience to the voice of God for their breakthrough. Imagine if Paps never answered his call. He said he was told by his uncles, you are going to look for coins as a preacher. But some of us were going to manifest based on his obedience. And even you in your own way, some people's blessings and breakthroughs are just hanging around their heads because you're still hanging around the brook that are dried. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So this woman had seen death. And if you don't believe me, maybe you've come here and your situation seems dire. Ask Lazarus when you go to heaven. Before he said, Lazarus, come forth. Jesus had a conversation outside the tomb. And I believe Lazarus was party to that conversation. But he was waiting for his command. Lazarus, come forth. Because he had that, it means he was party and privy to what was being said before Lazarus come forth was said. So you have been told to make a move. And you're still waiting. Should I? Should I not? By faith, the elders obtained a good report. Aren't you tired of having bad reports day in, day out? Aren't you tired? Aren't you blaming the devil too much? He's foolish, yes. But aren't you blaming the devil too much? Have you done your bit in obedience to the voice and the command of God? Have you done your bit? Now faith. Move now. And sometimes we don't move because we want to consult. Consulting leave for the government. And the government consults a lot because there are a lot of sitting allowances. Forget about consulting. When God has commanded you, who else would you consult? Why would you want to go a step lower and disrespect and, and hold a fist in the eyes of God by saying, yes, you have told me, but I need to talk to my ex-boyfriend. Yes, you have told me, but my ex-girlfriend, I remember, used to be a prayer warrior. So I need us to pray for seven days. But the voice of God has spoken. Why are you going a step below to ask people on, on the physical realm who also maybe need God more than you? In fact, your obedience is what they're waiting for. Hallelujah. No, hallelujah. So you're being set for a new season. Can I get an amen? No, can I get a better amen? You are being set for a new season. And from having nothing, you know, God is asking you, what do you have in your hands? Everything you need. If you read the book of Jeremiah chapter number one, before you were born, I knew you. Before you were bathed, I consecrated you. If you study that father, it means everything you need is within you. Then when you meet the conditions of within you, he now connects to you to others who have also met the conditions of within them. That's why he says, how can two walk together unless they agree? Hallelujah. So she was told, just do it. As long as your God lives. Remember, her faith is not on man. Her faith is on the God of the man. That's why the Bible says, cast is the one that puts his trust on man. If God wants to bless you, he sends a man. But even if the devil wants to finish you, he also sends a man. Or a woman for that matter. Isn't it? So the trust 
and you can you cannot have faith in somebody you tr in, in somebody you do not trust and that is why when you all came in here i doubt and i never saw any one of you lifting the chair to see if there's a crack you just did what sat on those chairs because you had faith that it will hold your weight then when god is saying trust me you want to interrogate god yet you did not interrogate plastics that were made in the industrial area you will not move god with your suit by the way, you will not use God with your superlative English, by the way. You will not use, uh, impress God with your, your academic qualifications and your paycheck. No, God takes not when faith is involved. Hallelujah. Your beaker is fine, it's good, it's a blessing, but it doesn't move God. After all, he gave it to you. But faith that is rhomboxious, that is crazy, that makes people think this person has lost it. You are, do you know there are people in church who have so much faith that their relatives say you're in a cult? And some of you, have been, I'm sure, have been told that. Isn't it? You're a form four. But God told you during the anointing service, take your application. I remember like it was yesterday at the old sanctuary. One Friday... I had been in court the morning, children's court that morning, with Wabala. In the evening, Bishop says, I want to talk to you. And when the base comes, you cannot ignore. And he says, this court case, the devil is trying to make you lose focus. Those words I remember like to say this morning. So forget about it. But in the physical, I wanted to fight hard. In fact, I wanted to show off. I had lawyers. You walk in, you think I'm a coach of a football team. I wanted to show off that you know what? I'm a lawyer man. I'm going to fight back. But the voice said, the devil wants to make you lose. When I obeyed, it saved me money. Today, I have the best relationship with my daughter and her mother. But imagine... With me for one minute, had I ignored the command of God through his servant. It would have been crazy cases after crazy cases, my daughter hurting and relationships broken. I want you to think, what about you? What command have you been given? It doesn't make sense. But guess what? You've got to do it. And verse 14 says, For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, The bean of flour shall not be used up, nor shall the jar of oil run dry until the day. In fact, this is my punchline. Until the day the Lord sends rain on earth. It means when you have faith, there is divine provision. Until the day when you see that which your faith had seen before the physical had embraced it. So when you walk in faith, people will be wondering, how comes she is being fed? How comes she has Uber to church every day? How comes she is still dressing well? How comes our children are still going to school? Not realizing because of your faith, somebody else's obedience was activated and paid your kids school fees. Until the time when your faith has pushed you to the manifestation where now God gives you a job in the United Nations and your kids go to a GCSE school. But until the manifestation, ladies and gentlemen, you have to have rhomboxious faith where it doesn't make sense to anybody but your spirit and the spirit of God know what is happening. So you are walking with a smile and people are wondering, this one has no husband, this one has no wife. But you have a swag in your walk because the voice of God had spoken. Hallelujah. No, hallelujah. Forget about over the bar. Oh, that guy also had faith. Do you realize by the time you are in the World Cup squad, you are among the best in the country. So they don't expect you to miss a penalty. But one crazy man said over the bar 15 times. 
on the 16th time, the manifestation of his faith was clear for all of us to see. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Please, let them laugh. Let them speak. Let them mock. Let them abuse. But the time the Lord lifts you to another level, your friends and your enemies will have one thing in agreement, that the results are clear for everybody to see. Can I get an amen? No, by the way, your amen connects to what the Lord is saying. Amen? Hallelujah. This woman was about to die. Take me to Luke 19. Luke 19. The time has come when the Lord has said, I am shifting you to another season. Let me tell you, whether you like it or not, whether your friends like it or not, and by the way, if God was to consult with your friends, some of you even if God was to consult with your own spouse, you would be in the bottom of the pile. Now can I get an amen? Luke 19 verse number 30. It's your moment of visitation. In fact, I'd called this sermon the fertile widow. It's an oxymoron. Eh? You're a form four. You're a diploma holder. But you're a CEO. Did you know Bob Collymore has never been to university? Does not have a degree? Does not have a master's? But his PA must have a master's. What are you talking about? And I will say it again. <laughs> Verse number 30 says, saying, go into the village opposite you. Where as you enter, you will find a cold tide on which no one has ever sat on. Lose it and bring it here. Go on to 31. And if anyone asks you, why are you losing it? Thus you shall say to him, because the Lord has need for it. You have been tied for too long. This thing was tied and you're perambulating in one geographical area. If you go to the village and you see a cow that has been tied, he can, he, it can only eat grass to the level of the string or the rope that is around its neck. And that is where some of you have been. And people have kept you there. And by the way, you have also kept yourself there with the words. Uh, how are you? We are struggling. Who said you are struggling? No wonder you are alive. Is a struggle. So, the Lord says in this new season, untie them. If any demon asks, that auntie of yours who walks with one eye because she's a witch doctor, if they ask, why do you want to do, what do you want to do with my grandson? After all, four generations back, they're submitted to this witchcraft. Tell them the Lord needs me. It doesn't matter whether you're going to limp, limp out of that place. But let me tell you, when the Lord commands, obedience is key. You have been tied for too long. Maybe even four years running, you answer the same altar call. You are so used to altar calls. Altar call of headache, 2015, you are here. 2016, after a prophetic word, alt, uh, headache, headache, you are here. You are a man. They even say, if you have no husband, because you are used, you want to come back. Because you are so used to being prayed for because the devil has bound you. Altar of manicure. You are a man and you are coming. Because you are used to your situation. But time has come, ladies and gentlemen, that whether the devil likes it or not, we are going to shift to a new season. Yeah. Hallelujah. Don't laugh with the devil. He is foolish. He is uneducated. He is a mumu. But you are breaking out. You are breaking out. No, you are breaking out. If you read Matthew 12, Matthew 12, give me Matthew 12, because you are breaking out. I, I mean, there is nobody after this, is we are just going to have thanksgiving upon thanksgiving. Because when the blessings of God fall upon you, you will walk into blessings. In fact, not walk into them. They will follow you. You sleep, they wait for you. You are showering, they are holding the soap for you. You walk in such blessing because your faith connected with the obedience to the voice of God ushers you to a level that not many people operate in. Hallelujah. 
No, hallelujah. Give me from 11. Hallelujah. Go on, 12. And please, as I minister, as I minister, I want you to think real hard. And verse 13 of this says, he said to the man, stretch your hand. This man had a withered hand. Some of you, you have been withered with hopelessness. You have been single for so long until you are a principality in being single. The only thing you can do is being a committee member. You're almost opening a, a Facebook page for best committee for weddings. Contact me. Because you have been attending weddings not as a bride or as a groom, but as a committee member. That you have become a principality that you are trusted far and wide. That when God says it is your time for marriage, your hand is still holding you back. But when the command came, stretch. If you have no faith, it may not come out. You may even say, let me do it at home in case it backfires. But when you have a rombocious faith, what do you do? You stretch. And the Bible says it was restored. So you left home like this, but you're going back home like this without a care. So I don't know what is holding you back. But when the voice of God comes forth, that in this new season, stretch. In fact, do this. Don't knock somebody, but just do this. You got to stretch. By the way, it takes faith to do what? Because you are so used to being like this. Being like this. People see you, it's an abnormality. But to you, it is a normality. Because for years, you have been with it. But time has come to stretch. And let the manifestation of the voice of God be evident for all to see. Well, Pap said something here. That sometimes he can touch your mind. But the devil can still hold you back. Let me tell you, if you didn't believe what he said, go to Luke 13.10 and I just give you scripture to underscore that yes, you can come to church every Sunday. You can come to church every Tuesday, but the devil will still play around with you. Hallelujah. Now he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. Go on. And behold, there was a woman who had the spirit of infirmity 18 years and was bent over and could in no way raise herself up. Go on. But when, somebody say but. For students of English like some of us and the, fellow, the few Lewis who are here, when you see the word but, it comes to change the course of direction. Can I get an amen? Imagine you, young man, when you go down on your knee and you tell your, fiance, your girlfriend, will you marry me? When she says yes, and then she says but, your heart will start beating because there is a change. So, but when Jesus saw her, he called her to him and said to her, woman, you are loosed from your infirmity. This woman had one season for 18 years. And by the way, she went to church because Jesus did not meet her in a restaurant. So, she came bent. Some of you come to church, but you are bent with burdens. Some of you come to church and nothing seems to manifest in your life. Because sometimes you come to meet your friend at the parking. Sometimes you come to see how the drummist will play the drum. But let me tell you, the few who are coming to meet the deity that is Jesus Christ, the season must shift. And the Bible says 18 years. How many? 18. From 0 to 18 you can vote. 18 years. Says, you are loosed. Go on. I want to show you something. And he laid hands on her. And immediately. So what was happening differently for 18 years? But when you come face to face with your Kairos moment, when Jesus decides for you, for you, for me, 
whether the enemy likes it or not, I am shifting you to a new season. She was like this and this to her was a new season. He was like this and this to him was a new season. I don't know for 18 years what has been happening. For 12 years there was a woman with the issue of blood and if you realize there was no even name to these people they were called by their situation and let me tell you immediately she touched the hem of the garment. A new season came into play. Please go on. And, and immediately she was made straight and glorified God, not her boyfriend. Go on. Just go on again, 15. And, and the scripture says, by the way, this lady was in the lineage of the Abrahamic blessing. She was a daughter of promise. But how can I be a daughter of promise? And for 18 years, I am bound. And Jesus said this woman had been bound by the enemy. Yet she would go to church Sunday in, Sunday out. But let me tell you, if you're not careful, you may come in here the same way. You may leave this place the same way you came in. Because it's, the onus is on you in faith to connect to what has been said today. And then obey to the voice of God. And then in faith, make a move based on what God has told you. And see if God is God. If you read book, the book of Genesis to Revelation, God has never lost a battle. If there's a Bible, you have that God lost a battle. Come for money, you need another Bible. When God speaks, no demon in hell can stand. No scheme of man. No WhatsApp group. No Facebook group. That's really they are called what? That abuse you like they abuse me twice a week. They will not stand. Because as they abuse you, I know the faith I have. And I obey the voice of God. You will say this, but God has said that. And then you wonder, how comes what we are saying is not manifesting? And maybe some of you who are in that group are looking at me now. And you are saying, Kiko Hapa. But it is okay. I know what the voice of the Lord said to me. And I have faith. And I will operate in obedience. If you are waiting for me, wait for me on the other side. Hallelujah. What they said vis-a-vis -vis what God said. I know which side I would be leaning on to. I say to you, no demon in hell, no WhatsApp group, no Facebook group can bring you down when the Lord has said, it is time for your lifting. And let me tell you, if you believe what I've just said, your amen will be anointed. Yeah. Hallelujah. So today, because my time is far gone and I like respecting time. If you can't respect time, there's nothing you're doing in this life. Hallelujah. So when Jesus steps into your situation like he has today, let me tell you when you walk out of this place, you're walking with a different season. It is time to shift. In fact, what you're going to do, you are prophetically do this to your hand. You know when this hand is like this, even fighting to defend your own child is a problem. Did you hear what I said? People will mock you. In fact, they will come on your weak side. But they do not know when you are at your wit's end. The Alpha and the Omega. The Rose of Sharon. The Lion of the tribe of Judah. Says, this is my son. This is my daughter. I will come and stand in that position. If they have a problem, they have to get to me first. I would rather God on my side than an army full of AK-47s. Ask David when you go to heaven. And you have to have faith you're going to heaven. Say amen. So let's do this. And let me tell you something. To some of you, this may just be a physical action. But to the ones who see, because there's a difference between looking and seeing. You can look at your hands stretching, but you can see why it is stretching. So on the count of three, Give me that swag. We are going to stretch and as we say thank you to God that he has ushered us in a new season. For too long, ladies and gentlemen, they have laughed and attacked you on your weak side. But today, this morning, the word of the Lord comes forth and say, I give you a new season. One, two, three. Let me tell you something. Walk into your new season. Have apostolic audacity. Walk like a child of God. Let nobody stop you because this is your hour of visitation. And let me tell you something. Today, they have laughed at you because they physically saw your withered hand. But you're going to answer the devil eyeball to eyeball. 
by the time I'm finishing service, you must all be in front over here to tell the devil, I am walking with my arms stretched wide. And may the Lord bless you. <laughs>